Hello, and welcome to Ride the Omnibus podcast and or Ghouls Magazine. I am your host, Ariel Abaska, slash contributor to Ghouls Magazine. I do want to just tell you, this was a wonderful interview that I had with two lovely gents, Joss Holden Ray and Theo Reese. Theo is the director, and Joss Holden Ray is the co-writer, as well as the musical director and composer and lyricist of a horror musical. This is a very unusual film. It's a horror musical that is about a taxidermist who wants to live her dream of stuffing a human. And she happens to find one on the internet and out of his fear of aging, he's willing to become her specimen. It's a magical, magical film. It's a wonderful conversation. I hope you'll check out the trailer right now. No one survives decay. Everyone cracks and fades Preserving life's my goal, my art Sustaining something so But you're not enough See, I crave something greater A human to stop You're perfect Am I? I'm going to warn you, like, I may get kind of militantly feminist uh, as we talk about this film, because I loved it right. from so many aspects. <laughs> I, I just want to say I'm all for equal representation of women as serial killers and, you know, <laughs> taxidermists and, you know, all kinds of beautiful things like uh, the lovely Alison Fitzron is in this movie. And I just adored that. From the outset do you, do you know do you know of her before i feel like i did but i i really recognized her but i couldn't figure out what from she i hey. i'm not she was in um a stage show and if if you're a fan of musicals she was in i can't remember which one it was but she's been in a few a few fairly big stage shows i think okay. um she just like was she in matilda so. no she wasn't okay Oh she no, wasn't. of course she wasn't. I'm sorry. That, no. Yeah, that was um I can't remember who that was. But she was she was absolute she was like a an incredible find for us. Like she was real she's she was really special. Yeah, she's fantastic. Really, really fantastic. Yeah. I mean it was like literally it, it you know because it, should I should I start? Should I keep talking? Yeah, go Is this ahead. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. Like, you know, are we kind of um no, she was I mean, the the whole process of, of finding her from the beginning was like, um, you know, we, we made this for no money. We had no money right from the beginning and it was it was hard for us to be able to, you know, to, to go down any of the traditional routes like casting directors or anything like that, because having no money, not really, really having a, um, a similar film to be able to say, we've done this before, so can you get someone interested? It's, it was really difficult. This was a bit of a kind of, you know, many respects has become a bit of a calling card for us. And I think the, um, so I, I was scouring this website called uh, Mandy, which is a, a casting website that, you know, I'm not sure if it's in the US, but it's in the UK. And, um, and it's you know it has it has everyone my mum's on there you know like ev everyone who who you know it's a, it's a total mix of of um of kind of of different levels of actors um throughout the country and throughout the world you know and um and so i sort of posted some things out and got a few responses but wasn't really getting anyone that felt right for the character or that that felt like we really engaged with and uh, so i was literally i was scoured through every um I think every 
women over the age of um, around 30 because wow. I had to bracket it somehow and um, or between between a certain um, roughly a certain playing ages of a certain of a certain age range and um, and sort of selected view and I found Alison I found Ali and, and and it was it was just like a perfect fit immediately sort of had a, I think we had a zoom call with her or I had a call with her and she sent through a sort of sample of her singing as well and um and it was just an incredible fit and she really grew the character you know throughout the whole process it was quite amazing um you know and she really put herself into it because there was a point at the beginning she had a few other projects on and I I think she was a bit nervous about whether she could sort of take on all of the you know um well the lyrics learn all of the lyrics yeah. and I think I sort of told a little fib where I was like oh it won't you know it won't be that lyric heavy don't worry you know it's not it's not it's not too bad you know I think we were halfway just as halfway through writing the songs at that point so it was it was um you know I was like yeah it'll be, don't worry Ali it'll be absolutely fine you know we'll go slow and um obviously it was quite a lot to learn but she just nailed it consistently yeah I think she also like I mean the first time she came to sort of we, I mean we only had like one day or kind of two little sessions of rehearsals before we recorded their vocals both the actors and um and she came and she just like it was amazing she knew she just knew everything and it's actually like you don't realize when you're writing it but it was really difficult <laughs> and it was really difficult to sing and it was um it was a really difficult part and she also brought something that was like i think kind of unexpected to it because um you know the part i think uh when you know you instinctively when you write a part like that you imagine someone being very like 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 kind of like uh a lot of uh a lot of characters in kind of musicals that are very much like ah, and kind of like evil or something like that but she came and she has like a very like um she has a very like sweet kind of soaring voice and i think it brings so much that was kind of unexpected to that part mm -hmm. um but works i think so much better then I think we would have done if we'd have kind of maybe got more of a kind of voice that we expected out of that part. So she for definitely sure. like she brought so much to it for sure. And mm. and you know opening with the organ and you know with the with the glass you you feel like okay maybe this is a Mrs. Lovett kind of character and then you have that sweet voice and it's just like no this is this is something completely different and it's. <laughs> Wonder but, yeah, exactly. And I, I think it makes her way less of a her voice. You, you're exactly right. You imagine it being a sort of um, like a Mrs. Lovett or like the the mother from Tangled or something, yeah. a kind of evil character. But yeah. when yeah, when she opens her, her mouth, you all of a sudden you kind of think there's a kind of like there's a softness to it, and there's a kind of um, there's something quite endearing about it, and something you instantly relate to that character. She doesn't feel like a caricature. She feels like it just feels very much more like it's a kind of um, it's a voice in her head, and you're kind of with her um mm -hmm. yeah I, and i think she, yeah it was kind of a little bit unexpected but i think it works fantastically well for her yeah it does. i think what was really important as well from the beginning is with this story is humanizing the characters and she's not someone they're not supposed to be kind of an evil she's not supposed to be an evil caricature um and so that really helps with that i think that was really important for us that you saw when you watch her something behind this desire yeah and I love, okay, can I just say that I love that you have this portrait of her that is very much about relationship versus career. I know this sounds, I, I don't know, does this sound weird? But like, you know, the, the conflict of love versus desire to create or love versus desire to, you know, actually do the thing that you love most in the world and you know that conflict that a lot of women face was something that i felt very palpably in this film that i really enjoyed about that that sequence that they're both singing and you know i i wondered if that was at all like a conflict you were deliberately playing on um from the women's I, standpoint at all but i i think that's yeah, I think that's you definitely kind of hit the nail on the head um, because I think a lot of it is it is to do with um, uh, particularly just generally in relationships when you sort of like you kind of lose yourself a bit. And I think the the whole point of that bit where they talk about finding someone who understands like the other issue, you know, you look you go out into a relationship and you're looking for someone that kind of understands you. 
And then the problem is when you find them, you're so happy with that, you kind of like forget what they understood in the first place and you can kind of like lose yourself in it a little bit. And yeah, no, and I think it's definitely like, I think the whole kind of like the arc of it is that a lot of the time when kind of love is portrayed, I think particularly it's normally that like love is this end point and then there's other stuff mm. that kind of stands in the way. And I think for us in this film, it's it's kind of a flip of that. So that basically she has a very direct end point. They both do have something they want to kind of do. Um, and love is the kind of like barrier they have to kind of overcome in order to get to it. Um, I think, uh, I don't know what you think, Theo. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I think, you know, as with lots of these things, you you start writing them and you don't fully you don't you don't fully understand all of the characters or the themes or the 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 things that you end up exploring, you know? So I think when it, it's it's one of those things that has definitely grown into into that. I think that when we first kind of conceived of the project, it was like, you know, you, you don't really realize these things on on the surface level, but they they sort of slowly build out as you as you make it and as you develop it. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, and mm. you know the the whole concept of you know live forever by dying today. I just absolutely love that line. I mean, obviously you make good use of it throughout, but you know it's 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 absolutely lovely what you do there. And I also wondered about, um, you know, the sequence where she's looking on the internet for people to stuff. There are all of those specific random voices. I wondered how you sourced those random voices. Like, what was the casting process like for random voice that says, lol, is this Frank? You know. <laughs> oh well. Firstly, firstly, they were. You heard that? I they, you they were. All is this first? That was so very. That's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, the first, the first round of them, they were, um, they were all Joss, and um, and that was the, that was the initial plan. Was you know, well, not the initial plan. They were all Joss, and then, um, and then we wanted to. I wanted to sneak one in that was me, and then I think, uh, and then, and then the rest of them, the rest of them. I think one was Joss's uncle. One was. Um, uh yeah there were just people that you you found in the end weren't they yeah they were like um i mean a lot of the it was kind of uh I, I i kind of went online and i found like a kind of blog about like weird posts that were found on the internet and so a couple of them and like i tweaked them to rhyme and that but um yeah a couple of them were real ones in there i think the first one that opens is this this post i read where this someone was looking for someone to come around and <clears throat> and uh like jerk off on uh their like train sets and then they want them to like kick all the trains around and then there was a little note at the end that was like whatever you do don't break the trains because they're my son's uh they're my son's train set so just come and do this but don't anyway so there were loads of weird ones uh, that i just kind of found and put into uh put into that but um yeah and i think they were all me to start with and then we realized that that sounds crap um and so we kind of I think one of the, there was a singer who's a friend of mine, my housemate, my uncle agreed to do one. Theo does one. I've got one line still left in there somewhere. Um, yeah, I have to say it's amalgamation. It, from the beginning, that was my favorite part of the film. I think um, the kind of the dive, diving online is such a kind of key element to where the story begins, yeah. and it's something that I've been really fascinated by for a long time. You know, the kind of the history of the dark web and the whole the whole mystique of that process of you know a secret world that we can kind of all access, where anything can happen and all of your dreams can come true, and that's super dark and mysterious. That you know. This, because you know, I, I remember as a, as a kid going on the, you know, downloading the tour network and and sort of having a look at the dark web, and it's it's just fascinating. It just feels like this lawless terrain that um, maybe is the last sort of explorable lawless terrain that has everything in it, and um, and I think this is again where the root of the story, you know, the root of the original story comes comes into play because I'm, you know, the, the original idea just to jump onto that was, um, was based on the story of the German cannibal Armin Muse, who was, um, who found, who wanted, you know, who, who basically was a cannibal 
um, had a cannibal fetish. And there was this quite famous forum, I mean, famous because of this story called the Cannibal Cafe, which I'm not even sure was actually on the dark web. I think it was at that point on, on just on the normal web. And it's quite fascinating. You can go back through and you can see all these posts and, um, and it's people living out their fantasies through this, this forum. And no one else, I think, in the forum was treating it very seriously other than being this, this fantasy. And, you know, we've learned a lot about the cannibal fantasy, I think, recently. Um, it's been quite, you know, quite a lot in the newspapers with Army Hammer and things like that, which has been kind of a, a very strange development. Um, but Armin wanted to take it a little bit more seriously. And you can see the original posts that he posted out looking for people. And um, he ended up meeting someone who wanted to be eaten. And they came together and, and there was this whole kind of farcical process that happened as they prepped this guy to be eaten and as they kind of went through this process and I, yeah, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating like I remember hearing the story when I was 13 and just being like oh my god I just can't there's so much in this that I can't fathom particularly at 13 you know the idea of wanting to eat someone the idea of wanting to to die and and that being something but also the idea of like finding someone to do such a strange thing with um it's kind of you know when when Joss and I first spoke about it, like there's, you can't help but wonder what that process was like, what those conversations were like, and whether there was something really genuinely, really kind of emotionally connecting about finding the one other person that actually understands and wants the same thing that you want, because that's so rare and so peculiar to find with this extremely strange desire to find someone that wants to be the other part of that or that wants to, or that understands your desire in its um, complete form is, is kind of beautiful and really romantic. And, um, and so that's where the kind of the basis of the story, you know, the exploration of the kind of this online world and finding, finding what you want from people on, on the online, on the online world, you know, where anything is, anything goes and you can kind of be whoever you want to be. And then coming together with someone and finding that you have a, a connection over something, no matter how gruesome or strange or, you know, unnerving and un, unfriendly within society, I think is, is kind of amazing. Is that kind of like the collaboration between you two? <laughs> you know what? It kind of was. It kind of was because we were at university and like, you know, this where I studied illustration and just studied music and no one liked musicals. Everyone hated musicals and people love to tell me still how much they dislike musicals. And they're like, oh, Phil, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm writing a musical. They're like, nah, I don't like musicals. And it's like, oh, OK, thanks so much. Good to hear. And, um, and I think Joss and I definitely, definitely came together over uh, and found each other over a kind of love of musicals yeah it's, it's it's really interesting that because it's definitely like um people saying they don't like musicals it's such a strangely broad statement that seems okay to talk about with musicals but you never say that about another entire art form yeah. because i guess like musicals have found themselves in a place where um where you you know it, it, it can be anything right it can be any style of music it can be any story it can tell anything mm. it, it's like a whole medium you can do anything with but we very much think about them as being just one specific style and one specific sound. Yeah. And like, like I, I do like a music theater workshop where it's just like workshopping songs. And yeah, and I remember um, on the first time I did that, lots of people bringing in, bringing in songs and playing them to the group. And, you know, I remember someone asking like, what, what style is this? And they go, Oh, it's musicals. It's a musical style. As if like um, that was kind of um, a style in and of itself, which is, um, it's definitely strange and interesting with musicals because yeah, it can be anything, but people very much, they know, it's, they think they know exactly what a musical is and how exactly it sounds. And yeah, you make an assumption on that. It's sort of like Andrew Lloyd Webber, Stephen Sondheim, and that's that. And you yeah, know, a yeah. lot of people sort of have that in their head for whatever set of reasons or Jerry Herman or whatever. Yeah. But like um, your work, I, I find your musical influences I, I hear, tell, I, I'm just curious about your particular influences in this work, because I hear if you know of Jason Robert Brown, 
I just kept thinking of parade while I was hearing the music, but I don't Joss know. Yeah, no, love, Joss is going to absolutely love that you just said that. Um, no, I think, yeah, definitely. I, I adore parade. It's my, it's my probably my favorite musical. Um, I can hear I it think, in the music. I just... Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a mix. I think there's some stuff, it's like more consciously trying to like bring in so there's like unconscious and conscious like influences i guess and the 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 conscious influences the ones i'm trying to do um are like sort of kind of you know old-timey kind of bernard herman kind of scores and mm-hmm. like um even more contemporary film sounds like i think we had like you know johnny greenwood and mika levi yeah. on the sort of um on our playlist for influences and i think that's kind of what we're going for but i just unfortunately can't help myself with like um, being, be, you know, bringing in like Jason Robert Brown and there's some sometimes kind of definitely influences in there. Um, yeah. But I think, I don't know, I think the two, I feel always awkward about a few moments in it because I feel like all of a sudden there's a couple moments where it breaks into what feels like a very um, big, glorious, glammy Sondheim musically bit, um, which feels always a little bit up at odds with the other sounds that we're kind of going for um but maybe they highlight each other in a nice way um which feels like an unexpected but nice thing um i certainly think that they do especially in you know certain moments like when she's suddenly discussing the you know process that he's going to go through in his transformation and Mm. you know i mean the, the contrast works really well when the music sort of explodes outward. And I, I, I sort of feel like the Bernard Herrmann influence and the Sondheim influence work together really well in concert together. But mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, those moments, as you say, when it explodes out, we're always in this battle with, you know, how much, because writing musical music for film and writing you know and, and putting music putting um putting a musical to film obviously is a very different process to putting it to stage you're, you're telling a different story in a different in a different way um and i think there's there's always that kind of balance where from the beginning we were we were sort of actively trying to steer away from the sounds of you know a traditional big kind of you know and as much as you say that you know there's the, the you know the the musical sound that you that you might recognize if you said oh it's musical style you know we're trying to sort of gently steer away from that but there's you know at the same time i think you you need moments of that because you know as a musical fan they fill you with something they fill you with that kind of um excitement and and, and real connection and real feeling um for and the that characters. sense and that sense of something which could not be expressed other than in song. Exactly. And it's those moments, you know, that kind of traditional trajectory of, you know, um, which, which we don't follow necessarily within this, but the traditional trajectory of, you know, when you run out of things to say and you can't express your emotions anymore, then you turn to song. You know, I think you need that kind of those, those glorious moments that really kind of come together and, and make you feel something. Um, they're really important. And for me, like there's a, there's a part in the film where, um, after they're discussing how he's going to be and that this is where this perfect this mix i think works really really well is when they're discussing how they're going to go about the process and it's an incredibly dark kind mm-hmm. of thing to be discussing and it's a yeah. very dark song but what that does is it transitions into this 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 feeling of connection of the two of them yeah. as their excitement builds and as they they realize that they're kind of both really excited about this process and really excited about being together and for me that's the kind of perfect mix of the two where you know you don't need to steer clear of of these um of some of these kind of musical sounds um because they're there for a reason because they work you know yeah Mm. i think i think there's also definitely just building on something you were saying i think there's something quite interesting about writing something specifically like a musical specifically for film, because I guess a lot of even the film musicals that you get are like adaptations of stage shows. And I think a lot of like musical theater writing comes, uh, comes from like a a very kind of utilitarian need for like, for example, the singer to be heard. Um, For example, like only using like perfect rhymes in moments because when you're singing at the back of a theater, you need to be able to those to be like super clear and making sure that like it's not over orchestrated underneath um moments which are like narratively important the lyric lyrics wise 
and I think it kind of gives well it gave me I feel like it gives it gave me a lot of freedom knowing that it's for film to be like I can put all the instruments in here and have the singer whisper basically which is like a nice yeah. a kind of nice feeling and I think um I think it would never work for stage well, with the current orchestrations that it has because the singers would be drowned out the entire time but luckily you know because it's all through film we can like I don't know we can create like a a bigger sound and we can also kind of also have it be quite intimate and nice and kind of um yeah which i think um you would never get out of like a stage musical basically yeah and the creative control that you have within you know the framework of having the two of you working together in concert to craft the writing of the film and the you know, kind of designing of the shots, even if, you know, you obviously have a wonderful DP you worked with um, who's crafting the specificity of the shots. But I, I just wonder, you know, in terms of the writing of each moment within the script, how carefully did you feel you had to time the music to the shots? Or was that a conscious effort? It was... I you, you go for it. Oh, I, was, I was gonna say, I think we kind of, I think because this project started as quite like a, eh, we'll just make something. And I think the original plan was like, we'll write it this week and we'll shoot it next week on like a phone <laughs> or something. And then it just really smoked. It was never on a phone. It was never gonna no, be on a phone. No, it was gonna be on like your <laughs> Canon or <laughs> no, your no, 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 whatever, no, yeah. no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, 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 that was the original plan. I think, I think because sure. we were quite blase about it at the start during the writing process, I think we kind of like we trusted each other quite a lot and we kind of in a way kind of left each other not to it but for example i hadn't heard any of the um the non-sung spoken parts until i was on set oh <laughs> really I, so I, like I, I the think... m5 you just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah for example that and i i love that i i was laughing my ass off when when that happened on set because i it's so funny as well because i think all the lyrics are very like got ideas ahead of their station and they're singing all this kind of like overly beautiful stuff and it's like the m25 is my favorite motor i was laughing my ass <laughs> off um but i think for example i didn't hear that and for example i think also when i was like because how we kind of like laid out the basic framework of like together of like oh we want it to start like this and then we'll have a song that sort of does this and it was quite like a loose thing and then i went away and kind of just wrote it but then also you gave me the freedom because i remember there's the um the like I love you line at the very end when they're in the bath um s spoiler alert um but I guess like you know he says like I think originally we decided like they would declare their love for each other they both say I love you and then he would drink the poison um but I think when I was like just writing it I recorded the one one line saying I love you and then I went back to do it and was like hey what if I just leave it so she, she doesn't say it back and then I think mm. that really adds something to it and I think I, I think we just kind of like just kind of trusted each other to do our own things on it um like also for example like Theo you had no idea how it would sound right as in we, yeah. we recorded on set with just piano vocal backing tracks and there was just an element of trust going that way that was like hey just trust me Theo it's gonna sound it's gonna sound, it's good. Gonna sound good I think there's <laughs> a whole you know you you kind of you, when when you I think when you when you kind of make something like this you firstly with with like I said earlier about with the, the ideas things absolutely grow and develop you know so you start from a place and you, and you have the very basic of a story basis of a story and what you want to achieve you know and we lay down references and like just said you know finding kind of Johnny Greenwood tracks and going okay this this track here this feels like the tone of where we want to be at this point you know and laying out those kind of sections talking about what we wanted to deal with in in each of the songs and and generally how we wanted the tone to feel but I think you know from where each of us started to where we ended up is obviously a, is a massive journey of kind of just finding things and, and seeing what works and slowly developing things as much with the kind of the visual of the film um, as well as the music, you know, it's, you know, it, it initially purely down to a, a budget constraint, we weren't going to be able to shoot in a, in a location like we, we found we, it would, it was going to, which would of course donated or, and, and changed the way the, the whole film felt it was going to be somewhere much more suburban. It was going to be in a world that was a, a little bit more kind of um, suburban 
kind of picket fence kind of area, partially because that's what we could afford, you know, and that's what we could get. And obviously through the kind of development of the project and through finding things, that's how you, you know, you, you slowly develop it. So, so much of it was a surprise. And I think, um, or, or kind of surprises you along the way, not just a, in a complete surprise, but surprises you along the way. But I think the, the process of, for us, like, or f- for me with the timings was once we had the tracks um, back, once I had the, the, the rough recordings of the tracks back from Joss, I storyboarded the whole thing. Um, and that kind of allows you to, to piece the film together and work out what feels like it's too long. I don't think we ended up cutting anything on the music but we definitely ended up extending certain tracks and bringing and, and sort of pulling things out where it, along the edit process where it, it didn't quite, we didn't have quite have enough time um, or it felt like we needed a little bit of space before a certain line came in. So I think that whole kind of timing process worked, worked, you know, I think if we, if we did it again, we'd, we'd, maybe do it in a slightly different way and learn lots from the way we did it, but it certainly ended up working for us. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I think, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say as well, I think we're talking about like things being a surprise. I think because like we had zero budget and because we were asking people to basically work for free, like people only came onto the project if they really liked it and they really kind of like, um, they really enjoyed it and stuff. And so I think like, uh, I would say that like potentially like Liz, the art director and Pierce, the DOP, like very much like put their voice on it as well. Um, And so like everything, everyone that came on to work on it, it wasn't really like they were sort of like employees doing our vision. The director below me might disagree, Um, but um, it kind of felt like more like people were putting their stamp on it. Uh, Yeah, because they were coming on and working for free. And so it was important to them that they kind of like were expressing themselves through as well. I think with yeah, we're, we're, I, I totally agree. I think with with a project like this, where you you know with with short with making short films with no budget or with low budget, it is always a passion project. It's, you know, it, you, you you there's no reason to to. It's such long hours. It's you know for Liz, the art director, it was you know coming away for like a week and a half to work on on the project. You know and that's not including all of the kind of prep beforehand it's like it has to be it's such a big labor of love for, for nothing for for no money that you really have to i think you really have to believe in something you know you really have to believe in something and feel like um you're you you understand it and i think certainly the way that i like to work is definitely by 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 it is very collaboratively, you know, it's very much like developing things collaboratively and, and of course, bringing on people that you think have uh, work in a similar world to what you want to make and then, and then developing it slowly. Yeah. And that production design is just absolutely stunning with, mm. you know, such massive creepiness and just the, the beautiful morbidity of it all. It's, it's grimy. It's, it's delicious. I love it. And I Thanks. I just, you know, I really feel like all of the details came together in this short in a way that kind of shocked me when I was watching the film. And I I really appreciate all of the work that you two clearly put in. But I also wanted to say, like, finding both Alison Fitzron and Anthony Young and finding those two voices that fit together so perfectly had to be a real feat for both you and the musical director, Joss, I would imagine. Um, Joss is musical director. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. You were talking um, about another director and I, who was under oh, you. That's why I was. Oh, no, I meant, I meant below me on the, on my screen, but. <laughs> oh, oh, um, below you on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. never mind. I feel very stupid now. I mean, no, I, no, no, not at all. I, I, I think um, it's, they were very malleable parts and we allowed them to change for the people that were in them. And I think they fit together so well because it wasn't like, this character is like this and the voice is like this and the thing is like this. Um, we kind of allowed them to sort of like, and definitely like change some of the music to suit some of their vocals, the, the, the particular actors' vocals and things. Um, and as again, like what Theo was saying, it's like, 
it just was quite a you know more collaborative process and it was like looking at what's right for this actor in this part as opposed to I have pre-transcribed um exactly how this should be expressed or exactly the phrasing of this line and you should sing it like that um I think particularly Anthony has like quite a he has like an interesting voice because it's like um because it's uh it's really good (laughs) but it's quite untrained in a way he like I think he has like a very very amazing tone but it's kind of like if he if he like had I think was a more trained singer or had like more recent training the singers would be the I think vocal coaches would say to him musical directors would say to him like you're doing like way too much vibrato and it's completely messing up the rhythm of your thing of your like lines you're supposed to sing but I think that also gives him quite a unique voice and also quite like a, a human voice and what I mean by that <laughs> is that um he uh me and Theo discuss a lot. I think the reason people are put off of musicals is because there's this sort of like showmanship to them, which feels um, in a way, f- not fake, but um, that That's feels fake. quite like performative in a way. Like you're so, you know, I think people go and see a theater show and like you're trying to connect with this character who's expressing themselves, but how are you supposed to relate to a character that's like, this really polished, amazing, like, performer, because, you know, not everyone is like that. <laughs> like, um, mm-hmm. And I think there's something about particularly Anthony's voice that makes the character quite human, because there's something relatable about his voice, because it seems kind of a little bit, a little bit out of control, a little bit yeah. kind of um, over-expressive that... at some yeah. points. Yeah, There's kind that of goes vulnerability like... to it. Yeah, exactly. And if, like, I think if he was a more sort of... Um, staunchly trained musical theatre and he does I know that he is a trained actor obviously but like if he was had a more kind of recent staunch musical theatre training like I think that would be hammered out of it I think he would be told to have more control to sort of like support his diaphragm a little bit better in order to kind of like not wobble so much but I think those wobbles are kind of what makes it makes it feel like a kind of human relatable character I suppose yeah Oh, I couldn't agree more and I think it's like that there's there's also something that plays really beautifully in the, the sort of dynamic between the two of them you know him being um kind of or, or very submissive and um what's the word you just used um I, I think him, him being vulnerable. vulnerable that's it him being a very vulnerable character and um Araminta or Alison being someone that is that is the that has more power in that situation that is is more dominant by the nature of it and i think that that works really well between the, the two of them 100 percent. i think An- anthony was a um anthony i so i used to be in amateur dramatic i used to do a lot of amateur dramatics when i was when i was a, a little boy and um anthony was uh of course i did and anthony used to be in musicals with me when i was growing up in gloucestershire yeah. and um and he always had an amazing, it, it had an amazingly powerful voice. And I remember like, I was in Le Cage Fall with him um, years ago in Gloucestershire. And he sang, um, I am what I am. And it was, it was incredible. And I just remember it. Like, you know, I couldn't work out whether I just remember it being incredible because I was little and, you know, or I wasn't that little. I was maybe 14, 15. But, you know, when I was young and, and, um, experience but it was like i remember it being a really powerful um moment because of because of him and, but it's an amazing song obviously but it needs a good performance it's an incredible performance yeah. i think and um and i thought immediately this this felt like a role that was that could be for him that that, that could be a really good a really good fit and um and i'm so pleased that we did you know i, I think it wasn't something that he as i don't think he's done much musical theater recently so it was it was a yeah. kind of i think in some parts it was a, a sort of struggle finding the rhythm but it it worked really really well I, I the other thing i should say is like you know i i'm such a fan of um joss and i again talk about this a lot and i'm not i don't think it would i don't think it necessarily uh works all the time it's a very difficult thing to get right but you know there are moments in um les mis the film which of course was recorded all live on set. And I've heard lots and lots of horror stories about how complex and difficult and, you know, problematic that was. 
But what's amazing about that is that you can achieve something that, again, you can you find in theatre with that that live recording of a voice you know you you pull back the performance and instead of it being something that is because lip syncing is an incredibly difficult thing to to do and get right because there's so much to focus on and you're deciding the way the character performs months before you're actually there on set or or not when you're there on set Mm -hmm. and so I feel like that's naturally it's a it's a sort of stifling it's a stifling process and um, of course, we we didn't do that. We we had lip sync. It was all lip sync. But I do think that Anthony brought, by the nature of his performance, something that feels a little bit more, a little bit liver and a little bit, a little bit less rehearsed, almost partially because it maybe wasn't. But it, it was <laughs> like, like you know, it was something that was very. Um, it feels very raw, and um, and that was that was really important. I think it, you know, as as Josh said, trying to move away from um the, the the tropes and the feel of what musicals are very very often are yeah and and of course like you mentioned i am what i am and just like in that song you have to have a certain power and vulnerability for this role too mm. and i think that's, absolutely that's wonderful and and i also wanted to say going back to what you were saying about the collaborative process i mean you clearly see that in the way that the lighting works with the music um the the lighting is just incredible in this film um the way that Thanks so much all of that works of a piece so well um, and really plays well with the production design too. I mm. I just want to say I admired that very much. I mean, in terms of genre filmmaking, this is a pretty remarkable piece, I would say, on its own, even without the music. But obviously with the music, it's staggering. I mean, it's absolutely staggering. Oh, that's so lovely to hear. It's yeah, so funny because we, you know, we, again, like, like just again, said, you know. And I would buy the soundtrack. Like, seriously, I want the soundtrack. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Yeah, please, I think I think I guess so. I think Pierce, the DOP on it was kind of, he was like the celebrity on set, I would say. Um, because he, he was just like, I think he was someone who, uh, you probably know more about this process, Theo, than I did. You're more involved in this, but like we were quite shocked when he said that he wanted to do it because he has done some like really phenomenal stuff. Like he did that film Calm with Horses, and um, he's he was just kind of yeah. And so when he came on set, he was kind of um, he was kind of like a local celebrity, and um, <laughs> I, and also I think he it... just never said any word at all. I was like <laughs> met him, and he was like, "Film's good." I was like, "Thanks." <laughs> And that's like the only words we said to each other, like basically the whole time. I said a few more. I had a few, I had a few more chats with Pierce. Pierce isn't, Pierce isn't totally uh, silent, but he, um, no, it was amazing to to have him on board because of um, the experience. You know, I think that like you know, as a as a director, the thing that you need to do is surround yourself with people who are better than you. You know, and it's surrounding yourself with that's the first part of it is picking the right people to help you make something and to sort of join you in that collaborative process and i think piers's work was is just so classical and simple and when you watch when you look at his his other his other pieces you know there's nothing kind of over showy about anything and i think what works within this as well is that most of the lighting is actually incredibly simple but but very striking. And and that's the the most amazing thing about the way that I think he works. It's all incredibly natural and simple. You know, it's not mm-hmm. it's not necessarily pushing the form into um any strange places. It's it's simply observing in a really beautiful way. And mm-hmm. you know, there are there are there's um and as I said about the process of designing the shots, you know, I storyboarded it and of course, when you storyboard, you have way too many ideas and it's like placing down all, it's throwing down all your ideas and, and seeing which ones kind of stick and work. And it's great because you can build um, an, an, a, like a border matic, which is something where, particularly when you have music, um, you can build a border matic where you, you literally make an edit using the frames, which is an incredibly helpful process because you find that 50% of them you don't need, you know, because actually you want to hold on shots for longer. 
And the process for us was, you know, taking that Bordomatic and then working with peers to once again slim it down. Because there's there's what you there's there's the desire of what you want and all of the shots that you want. And then there's the nature of being in a space and seeing it for the first time with the person in there. And then of course there's the time constraint of having an, an hour or two hours to cover a scene. And whilst there's things that you really want and that would really work, actually there's a whole time issue where if you have to cover a scene in three shots what's the best way to do it so that you have the best coverage possible and that's where i think i really lent on peers and, and really relied on him to kind of build that to, to help with that time process of going it would be great if we had 15 shots for this scene but how can we do it in seven you know how, how does it work within seven and that's something that you that you get from the years of experience in in narrative feature filmmaking, you know, which, which is, was vital. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And I also just want to say, like, I love that at the very end of the film, I feel like it closes on the notes of a wedding march. It, am I wrong <laughs> in that? Just say yes. Just say yes. So, just sorry, say yes. Um, I'm just trying to think, say, say it one more time that it closes on the notes of a wedding march. Yeah, like it feels like the the final notes of the film as the, you know, title card flashes up, it it sounds like a little bit of like the end of a wedding march. Wow. No, I I mean that was as not fine intentional, but I absolutely love it. That's a fan, that's I mean I guess it it is what people make of it and if if that's what you took from it then that's yes, what i took from it, and it <laughs> like i of... i love that that's fantastic i'm gonna be next next thing one of these that we do i'm gonna say that. <laughs> i'm gonna claim it and say like yeah actually the the last notes were the notes for wedding were like in terms of the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> that's great take it take it take it do what you want with it but i want to say thank you so much for this enduring work that i you know, I I think is absolutely lovely, and I think is going to have tremendous success. And I I want to know where it's going to be playing, other than South by Southwest. Well, it's got a few. There's a few more kind of festivals that we're that we're waiting to hear from, and I think that we're we're getting this this potential of some nice places. I think it's playing in in Prague later in the year. Um, I think there's, um, I'd love to actually, it's been a strange year to apply to festivals and I'm hoping that we can actually have some real cinema screenings in the UK because as of yet, we've not been able to see it. And obviously it's been a real, you know, amazing to be in South by Southwest, very strange year to be in it because it would be amazing right now if Joss and I were packing our bags to fly out to Austin, but we're not. Um, but there are, you know, I think the, the next, the next place it will be is actually, it will be available online for free on the 25th of March. So immediately after wow. South by Southwest, which we didn't expect, but there's um, been an opportunity that South by Southwest have set up. So um, it will be available immediately afterwards. That's um, amazing. Yeah. And all our listeners should take advantage of that because it's an amazing film. But I also wanted to... Um, quickly say that uh and this part is going to be cut out from this interview that uh you should actually be grateful you're not going to austin texas because Re really how come uh, you hate austin? well no because texas has done away with a mask mandate like the oh, governor basically okay. declared the pandemic over wow, wow. so when i when that's, i said that gosh. my country is batshit crazy this is what i meant this is what I mean. I mean, oh, that's yeah. it's quite stressful, isn't it? Like it's a whole. Oh, oh you man. have no idea. I would rather be in lockdown than deal with this. Mm. Yes, yeah. I know what you mean. Insane. At least you see, with I, lockdown, it's, it's sort of like you know, you know where you stand. There's no, yeah. um, you're not putting any imperative on the person to decide about how safe they should be. It's like it's decided for you, so it takes that right. anxiety of choice away from you. <laughs> um, yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I can't help but keep watching all the anti masker videos online. Oh my god. I know. Like it's I find it's fascinating. 
It's not this, fascinating. This no, is uh, like... you're uh, 100%. <laughs> but it's this, it's sort of this interesting, it's the same thing that's repeated over and over again. It's this kind of, you know, you know, and they're, they're sort of quoting law laws that they've read online or whatever. And it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's scary. It's really scary. But, um, you know, praying that it's, um, we're, we're coming to an end slowly. I mean, it's been, it's been really like, Joss has just been vaccinated which is great yeah. news. I, all of the people that I care about most in the world have been vaccinated now, which is really, really lovely. It's a lovely feeling to sort of have that. And I hope that for everyone soon, because um, is, is how is it over there at the minute? Are they, is it kind of being rolled out quite effectively? Not effectively. Let's just say that in the United States, uh, people with good internet connections and the ability to be on internet at all hours of the day are the ones who are getting appointments. Okay. Wow. That's tough. Yeah. Mm. So therefore, not very many black or brown people are getting appointments. And, you know, like I, I have a lot of friends from the international community around me and, you know, they, they yeah. go and they're like, I, I was one of two brown people in line out of 60. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it, it's just yeah. the way it is wow. right now. Oof. I mean, there's a, there's a, I suppose there's a, um, an even wider massive issue, which is going to be the, um, the nature of the fact that, you know, we're so at the moment, we're all so internally focused on our own countries, you know, for yeah. reasons that are obvious you know it is it's a really scary time but like we're you know there's this kind of sense in the uk that like right okay we're we have this end point but of course what we have is a is a, an end point to one very 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 small country and mm -hmm. you know there are just so many people around the world that are like that are dying okay. every single day because of this and i think that's the, the the hugely scary thing is that you know all of these vaccines are coming into america and the uk and the rest of europe and the the cost and the the nature of rolling those out in in the in countries that are, are struggling worse than we are at the moment is is going to take years and years and years and but i'm also going to be very honest with you as long as there are so many anti-maskers in canada and the us we're all screwed. We're mm. all screwed. I suppose I imagine the anti-maskers are also the anti, often the anti-vaxxers. The the anti what? Oh, anti-vaxxers, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They're... I mean, they're pretty much one in the same. You know? mm. Mm. Think That's you really think scary. It wouldn't be because you'd think if you didn't want to wear a mask, then you would be desperate to. No, no. It's like no. The government's there, trying but, yeah. to control me. They're going to control mm, yeah. me with a vaccine. I mean, they were the anti-vaxxers about measles and mumps and rubella too. So mm. it's just an easier, it's like an easier narrative to tell yourself, like I'm being controlled by the government than the sca much scarier one of there's a disease that's killing millions of people around me. It's sort of like yeah. comforting in a way, maybe for them to be like, ah, the government are controlling me. Just a much more kind of tangible narrative than this like really surreal thing that's actually happening. Mm. It's not, true. Not that I'm, uh, not that I'm an anti-masker or an anti-vaxxer. Like, <laughs> I don't think I, I was under that impression. <laughs> well, I hope I hope you get to come back to the UK soon. I hope so too. I hope so too. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, great. You know, I mean, Joss and I have a. Sorry. Where about you based in America? I'm in DC area. I'm a little bit south of DC, so um, I nice. I have really easy access to Dulles and nonstop flights. So I tend to go to London every year. Um, I have for the last twenty five. But well, let's great. hang out next time you come. Yeah, I would gotta, love give us to. a shout. Give us a I shout. I would love to. Can can Just... I trade contact info with you? Yeah, of absolutely. Course. Yeah. You can come stay with us when you come. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you guys located in London? I'm just curious. Um, I'm in Peckham. Oh, okay. And I'm in Crystal Palace, so we're both southeast. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's cool. I have friends who are in Richmond and friends who are in Finchley and 
it's like weird suburban worlds whenever i go there but... yeah yeah i mean it's kind of it's that's when yeah. when you go to like when i go home to gloucestershire everyone's like oh london is it oh i couldn't live there couldn't live there too big way too big way too big and you're like all right cool it's similar to kind of what people like to say about musicals really and um but it's you know when you i think when you live in a big city it's like it's just a collection of small villages really isn't it like or small towns it's like i it's quite rare that you i go into the big city now you know it's like i mean particularly with lockdown it's like you just yeah. stay in your i mean why in would your bubble you? why would you yeah like, absolutely you know. absolutely but yeah anyway so i put my email in the chat so you can oh great send me a please a yeah we'll drop your line if you like and and i want that soundtrack damn it okay sorry just send the soundtrack yeah. <laughs> i've got well i've got actually uh yeah i've got the um i got the masters sent through for like the soundtrack versions of them today so oh wow um, that's so we exciting. should so basically this so hopefully when we release it we can also post it on spotify and that um and it will be properly that's set up amazing that. Yeah. Mm. that would be great because i think i think it's just wonderful music and it should be heard by everyone so thank you so much that's so kind Anyway. And thank you generally for what you said on the film. That's really lovely. I mean, this is the first sort of interview thing we've done. And it's like, it's really just lovely um, talking to people about the film. Because it's, you know, again, you, it, you, you kind of most of the time with, with stuff, you, you make it and you sort of put it online. Yeah. And you never really talk about it and you never really get to hear what people think. And, you know, and it's so interesting hearing the things that people take from what you've made, you know, and yeah. like, the, like the wedding bells. <laughs> well, not wedding bells, but no, the wedding chimes. Yeah, mm. the, not the, the wedding sound. chimes, but <laughs> the wedding march. But whatever. But I do want to just say thank you so much for your incredible generosity in this interview as well. I really appreciate it, and I wish you best of luck at the festival. I, you know, thanks I, so much. I know it's going to do well. So good luck. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You so and much. lovely to yeah, meet it's you. It's been really fun. Yeah. Lovely really to fun. meet you too. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.